Three fire, so he and this ugly uh, image becomes toast to ashes. But I cannot breathe fire or throw lightning bolts. This is the face of those soldiers killing unarmed men, women, and children and wounded knee. This is the face of soldiers and me lie. Look in the mirror and you may see that same face. It is the face that didn't question what that rock, what stands before me and for those of the future. And there will be faces in the future as surely as I write these words. The empire will have more ugly pictures of the American killers that are the same as the old killers. This is called The King in His Lair. A crawling king rests in his lair, curled up in the, by his computer using his tail to type. He tires of internet play. Too much energy expended on useless information. The last story on Yahoo News is about people showing their butt cheeks. That just makes Snake flick his tongue and roll on the floor with laughter. These two legs seem to be progressing somewhere but the king is not sure where. The king used to enjoy a good night out going to cafes, wears his sunglasses, listens to a good night of poetry, prose, rants, uses a shaker held by his tail to shake in approval. Now he finds poets replaced by tech heads talking shop. Their ability to carry on a normal conversation outside their tech world can get very strange. Poets show their age but not being replaced by the younger who can't live well, you know the story. Those who lived here left no longer able to make it. They say goodbye to a place they love, and more is lost. Another dispossessing that began in 1492 with the attempted annihilation of the people. At the 50th celebration since that summer, will there be a death watch for the poets and poetry in San Francisco, or will it be like a Fellini movie, Satyricon, in Rome, where poets and their poems sell out and are controlled by the rich. Poetry sold to the highest bidder. Control their soul and that leads to the death of writing. In the end, it is not poetry or even good prose. Through Though good poetry and prose lives, who will listen? Usen's empire follows its ancestor Rome by good example. The crawling king snake is concerned. Even the blues is under attack. Articles written that the blues played today are no longer classified as blues, but pop alternative. Some blues artists stop using the term blues. Life without the blues and poetry. Snakes know, snake knows something needs to be done. The blues is the motherload of all the few good things that came out of the empire. This music can't die. It's the source. The king scratches his head, flicks his tongue, slithers back and forth. That's it. He'll begin with organizing the Death Watch starting before the next big celebration. Street theater that cries out is a warning of the end is near. Will these, play, will these places and people who exercise their rights to speak have places to do so? Take the writers, poets, musicians, actors, and all the artists to the street, and then ask once they see, will they miss it if it dies? Crawling knows they can't miss something that they don't know they have. As Crawling King says, we are at my babies at the crossroad, crawling slips back into his lair to lay plans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was a call to arms because I'm serious. We're dying out here. People are leaving the city, and a lot of our venues now are getting smaller and smaller. The young young musicians are losing their middle uh, uh, weight. Uh, to play music. A lot of these clubs are closing. Uh, art spaces are closing all over this town. And I'm serious as a heart attack. If we don't do something, we're not going to be here. Nobody's going to be listening to us. So I think we need to talk about it amongst yourselves or whatever, or maybe take it to the streets and show us, show them what they're missing. That's all. <laughs> got that thing working again. It's amazing. Technology, I tell you, if it wasn't for technology, where would we be? Don't answer that. <laughs> All right. Uh, rhetorical questions. All right. Uh, 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 David. David Robertson is next. And before we uh, begin our round of uh, 
features with SF piece hope. Speak hope. So, David. Hey. So, two very short poems. The first poem I wrote uh, when I was stuck overnight at the Las Vegas airport. <laughs> Las Vegas Magnificat. Gamblers at the slot machines at three o'clock in the morning, looking for what's left of a power greater than themselves, hoping for an experience of grace, new form showing predestination, with randomness the last god, and complexity finally beyond us. Event horizon. Join rain falling upward to leap to the clouds. See leaves growing greener return from their shrouds to round to the circle that never arrives with no single purpose and no place to hide. Spiraling inward while balanced in stillness, they care not for boundaries or linear time. The center of the clocks disregard in their turning is everywhere present in limitless mind. No ground underneath me surrendered to lightness. I merge to a whirlwind where nothing's regained and nothing wished for returns in full measure. I'm past the horizon and nothing's the same. Thank you. So we're going to begin the feature. Now, just so you know who we have as a lineup, we have Jane Radis and Erica Goss, then Marvin Heimstra and Ken Safford. Now, Young would have been here, but there was a difficulty with his attending, so we about out. But Elizabeth Mack is going to come up here and maybe a brief statement. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. After the feature, we have a short break, and then we have uh, four poets, at least that I know of at this point, or five, after the break, and I'll let you know more about them in due course. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Tonight, we celebrate the fifth anniversary of San Francisco Peace and Hope. We have a fabulous uh, lineup of featured poets uh, tonight who are presenting, and we're thrilled that several contributors are reading during open mic. Al Young unfortunately was not able to uh, be here tonight. He had a family emergency and he has been here for yeah, each wonder, year. Yeah, Actually wonder. for four years he's uh -huh. been here but tonight he's not here and we miss him. But the show goes on and um, the inaugural book, our 2015 inaugural book, uh, came out recently, and uh, you can see it on the table there. And then we also received a Gold Seal Award um, from the Dancing Poetry Festival last month. We were very oh, excited right. about that. A yes. uh, special thank you to, to Dan, Dan Brady. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because of Dan, we're here for our fifth year. Five years in a row. Five years in a row. <laughs> and I will now close with uh, with a poem by Lark Burns de Beltran. She's a SF Peace and Hope contributor that used to live in Berkeley, but she now lives in Peru. And it's called Seize the Day. The moment is is a thin ledge. For mind hold to grasp, too often thought slides back into ectoplasmic clutch of memory, falls forward into aspirations twinkling star field. Work to widen the ledge, make the present a place to linger in comfort, unobsessed with front or back doors. Now we'll have 
have the program and let me introduce each of the poets, the featured uh, readers tonight. First is Jane Raddiff. She is a po poet, painter, and songwriter. Born in Wisconsin, she attended the University of Wisconsin. Her book of poetry, A Rosary of Poems, Five de Decades, was published by B. Attitude Press. Other books include Two Years in the Tarot, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Fortune Teller, and Midnight at Moms and Dads. Thank you, Elizabeth, that was a great introduction. I've forgotten that I did some of those things. <laughs> Long time. Uh, these are the two poems that were in the uh, the SF Peace and Hope book this time. The Painter Who Never Was. The canvas was stretched, but the frame was crooked and unsteady, like a sail in the wind on a boat on an uneven sea, waves breaking over the bow. The paint on the canvas fades, blue becomes pale, reds are now pink, yellows white, like the painting never was. The painter has disappeared, swallowed up by the deep. After a while, marine life returned to pristineness, crystallizing a future in tears, a boat of both, a canvas restored, a painter aboard, like nothing ever happened that we know of. And this is called Being in Many Lives. Do we inhabit each life we get, or are we separate from it? Do we know we are ourselves? I don't think so. I will see a man walking in a field in India. I'm on a train, and I imagine what it's like to be him, walking in the dirt, having nothing, the poorest. But what do I know? That's my slanted perspective like bugs on the screen, hit by the afternoon light, seeming rainbow-like. So I'm being many people, but being no one. I have been many people, and now I'm no one. I stand on lopsided ground. Thank you. Marvin R. Heimstra is a poet, humorist, editor, and social analyst. His publications include Poet Wrangler, French Kiss Destiny, and De In Deepest USA. He is founding editor-in-chief of the Bay Area Poet Seasonal Review. I'm delighted to be here. First, we have two poems about Asian calligraphy. First is called The Brush. My grandfather held the first brush in my hand. Working together, we made a circle for the universe. The ink was so black, I thought the brush must be alive. How could the brush do that? The next is a poem called The Moment, which was featured in the wonderful prize-winning San Francisco Peace and Hope. That moment. It is such a relief when a work of art is at last complete. Process, a high wire act, with every bit of body and soul dancing on the wire's edge. Time to hop off. Final signature ecstasy, my collection of seven calligraphy scrolls unrolls to celebrate a sublime black line in flight. That line is alive. I cherish each of the artists sealed through my magnifying circle and share that moment when seal touches the silk and the artist shouts. I did it again. Thank you, Mr. Dragon. <coughs> Down in a cup of sake. <coughs> Not a beach. 
<laughs> now I need a couple of sake the artist <clears throat> for the moment glows polished and complete now two short poems about cats cats extremely underrated to an extremely underrated cat purring in the sun on a desolate wall. The wall will be smashed to bits tomorrow. It isn't where you sit, but how you are. Keep up the good work, stoic cat. That wall will never forget you, and neither will I. poem titled Relax. Think of nothing except how good the sun feels on the cat's paws. Thank you all very much. has had poems published in the Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal, Bay Area Poet Seasonal Review, Nerve Cowboy, and Ambush. His chapbook, Strange Animal, was published by 3300 Press. He is a founding poet of SF Peace and Hope since he was one of the earliest contributors. And so now, here's Ken Saffron. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to read four poems which have been in various issues of uh, SF Peace and Hope. I'll leave you to figure out which issues it'll be like a treasure hunt. <laughs> but in truth, everything in SFPs would hope is a treasure. So uh, uh, this first poem is, is in the uh, latest edition, the uh, print edition. It's called Hello Blackbird. Mist has had its morning stretch and curled up under leaves. Ferns piano key the wood's edge. All I hear is wind until I'm close. Tiny flowers there with petals of sun and scary blood red hearts. Call them wildflowers or weeds. It doesn't matter to the bees or spiders waiting in webs between spindly stems. Who would think this a part of sky? Tangled leaves catch untie my shoes. Uh, this next one is an unrhymed sonnet. It's called Turning. Stars circle night behind heat waves. Their light distant as the dead. Stars come back. We name them. And because we love to wrap ourselves in pattern, Rigel and Betelgeuse shine in Orion, night after night for us, for as many generations as we want. Talking in their dark beds, flashes of red and yellows at their corners, a code, or trick of atmosphere bending light. What do they call themselves? What do they say watching our city shine? Of course I know the patterns are arbitrary, that scars never leave. We're the ones who turn away to bed and then to daylight as we must. This is a very short one. It's called Dancer and Flower. Dancer and Flower. Do not start with grace, but a cracked shell 
and push against the heavy dark, past the spiked shield of leaves, before the modest buds flower outrageously. And then this last one was in the in the first issue of SF Peace and Hope. I was going to say that. <laughs> And it's called Newton's First Law of Motion. Which, for those of you who don't remember your high school physics, Newton's First Law of Motion says, um, a body in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by a force, and a stationary object remains stationary unless acted upon by a force. This is a 9-11 poem. Newton's first law of motion. Is it possible to find them in what is today? Rain turns to snow. An avalanche of debris a moment ago was remarkably fragile steel. The image of security reflected in glass. So many lives rising and falling, choosing to stay still, poured like gravity onto brittle streets. This season of subtraction, light drains from trees, thin shadows touch all we ever loved. Wind has the last word, remember. Erica Goss is the Poet Laureate of Los Gatos. She received the Many Mountain Moving Prize for Poetry in 2011, was twice nominated for the Pushcart Prize and received the first Edwin Markin Prize for Poetry. She is the host of Word to Word on KCAT and writes the third form for Connotation Press. And now, here is Erica Goss. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Dan Brady. And it was really hard to wait through all those poets. Wow. And I patiently did. As you probably noticed, I wasn't switching too much back there. Um, I'm going to start with um, a poem called Eche Homo, which is There is the Man in Greek, I think. Um, and I want to start with it because it's in this current issue of San Francisco Peace and Hope, and it's an erasure poem. So it's a poem where you're given a big piece of text, and you have to take out 99% of it to find the poem that's in there. So I'm not sure why I found this poem in there, but there it was. Eche Homo. His feet are cut, his body's ready. We wait for the women. Hundreds rioted. You can feel it in the air, see it in the eyes. Mary went with me. Four thousand cheers. It was sunny, and they played some psalms. Who will rise against the evildoers? Who will stand up for me? The sun shining. She doesn't have much left. I made my way to her son, Joshua, resting there. What was the text? The title? Oh, the text? Um, I wish I could remember. I think I remember that. It was a piece of literature from the 18th century written about a woman in a period of, um, uh, it was a period of turmoil in England, and people were, ex uh, they were immigrating to the United States. And so that's where some of the words come from, rioted and didn't have much left. Um, and I don't know why I found that Bible story in there. Um, so this is a slightly tongue-in-cheek poem. It's one of those bad advice poems. The Art of Smoking. It's best to start young. Suck up secondhand smoke. Notice how careless adults are. Sneak a puff while their backs are turned while your grandmother brews another pot of Maxwell House. At 12, 
finish your first cigarette down to the filter, squelch the urge to vomit. At 15, discover menthols. Hang out in the smoking grounds at high school. Snap your jaw to make rings. Light up right in front of your mother. Blow smoke out your bedroom window. Play games where you try to go a whole day without one. Relish the ache that floods your body. Try to quit. Crumple the crush-proof box and let the tobacco drift through the air like confetti. Buy a new pack one hour later. Inhale and stagger around the room. At 22, visit your grandmother in the hospital. Forget to eat. Grow thinner and thinner. When she dies, smoke more. Wow. <laughs> that is bad advice. <laughs> that is bad advice, yeah. Don't take it. Um, this poem is about my uh, my maternal grandmother, also named Erica. Yes, I was named after her. Um, and one of this is one of those family stories that the more you hear it, the more unbelievable it becomes. But this really happened. There were witnesses, and I still kind of can't believe it. When my grandmother stood up to the SS, maybe her teeth were still on edge from last night's air raid, or maybe her children's cries of hunger had unhinged her. But when the SS officers pounded on the door, she explained in plain German that she would not display the required by law photograph of Der Fuhrer anywhere on the property she was forced to occupy. They could have arrested her on the spot, dragged her away from her four feeble children, but they backed down, still insisting, lowering their chins like boys caught tormenting a cat, ready to flee from what had from whatever had hurt this olive-skinned housefrau into near suicidal defiance. They left the pictures leaning against the fence, tilted like a tombstone. Soon the summer grass crept around the frame, and the rain melted their Führer's mustache, where it spilled onto the head of the blonde child, offering him a bouquet of flowers. This one is my one and only so far poem about sports. Um, so hey, wow. Um, I went to a hockey game and it, there was just something, I don't know, really poignant about that hockey game. So this is called Soul Hockey and it's about the Sharks, San Jose Sharks versus the Arizona Coyotes in the San Jose Stop Center in April of this year. And the, the Sharks won, by the way. Oh, Behind home bench, I see the young men raise their sticks. I wince. Are there mothers watching? Because I am. I can't pull my eyes from the goalie's knees, thwacking air like pinball flippers. Next to the arena, a woman waits for the end of the game, her belongings arranged on the sidewalk like hopeless furniture. If the home team wins, her cup that says, please help, might hold enough to buy a meal. The tipsy crowd crosses the street, happy, loud, hands skating in the air, stumbling through her muddled piles, clothing here, sleeping bag there. This time of year, the street should be sodden, but this sold out night is dry, and my heart skips, skids like a slippery disc across white ice. <laughs> All right, this is the last poem of the night. But you know, if you have any suggestions, like maybe I could write a football poem or, or maybe a, a soccer poem, that would be, a, I would take those for sure. So I was one of those weird kids who was not in the least bit impressed by the moonwalk. I was nine at the time, and I just couldn't even believe that it was really happening. I was like, no way, they didn't go to the moon. And besides, something else happened in my life that had a lot, it was much more important. And that's what this poem is about, Buck Moon. The buck moon is what they traditionally call the moon of July. I didn't ask why my country was moonstruck deep in the month of July when I was nine years old. I didn't care about the stiff, unflapping flag and even less about steps, leaps, or mankind. 
I was not impressed with the lunar module and its spider legs or the black sky or a man's footprint. I didn't know the US flag fixed upright in the bone dry dust was a challenge to the world. Beat this. I had no idea who the Soviets were. None of it mattered in that hot July, for I received a brother, knowledge that filled me with lovely pain and made me dizzy, like when I caught my first glimpse of a photo of Earth, its blue surface mottled with storms and continents, my head a whirlwind of ragged energy, spinning, spinning, breathless, euphoric, alive. Beat that. We had synchronicity. We both wrote about the, the, the moon and the thing. That's great. We're going to take a very brief break. We have uh, five poets coming up after the break. Mr. Greg Pond is in the house, and, and we have several other people here. Let me just give you a hint out of the joys will soon be yours. We have Jose Vasquez, Martin Hickel, Daniel Hadley, and Jimmy, I call him Jimmy Ireland, but that's not his real name, but he represents Ireland, and he's here. He's our, our, mini, uh, our mini feature of the evening, super duper closer, bulldozer, and then of course I mentioned Break Pond already. So about, about five or seven minutes, we'll be back up here. The streaming is streaming. I figured out how to fix it. The plug on the floor came out. <laughs> That's why I wouldn't go back. <laughs> anyway, so we're back on schmooze, talk to these people, check out the book, and uh, we shall reflect upon the things that need to be reflected upon. Reflect and speak. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So let me just uh, sit oh, back over here, here. Oh, take my seat, and I will read the, uh, the names again. The names again. Names again, names Three again, names again. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, we have, this is another new person, to the best of my knowledge. So we must treat this new person as a new person as he comes up here because I believe he is new. Jose Vasquez, why don't you come on up here while we... Now, I have to say this is not his first time here, but this is his first time meeting here, because he was he, he's not, he has built up his courage, and he really he, he saw us going, well, I didn't do that. Uh, no, I've, I've been watching from the back uh, for the past weeks, and uh, I've been looking forward to this every night. Our, well, I look forward to this every week. Uh, when wow. I, come here. I think all of you are quite talented. Clara, Stephanie, uh, Gregory, just wonderful. Um, and I've never written poetry. I've uh, never tried. So I'm going to read you one that uh, I've read in the past and one that I did have to write. So uh, please go easy on me. This is um, related to my father, who I think uh, is so connected to nature in his homeland in Puerto Rico. Um, and it's a poem by Joyce Kilmer called Trees. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the sweet earth's flowing breast, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. And the poem I've written kind of serves in contrast, but it uh, speaks to the speed uh, and robotic lifestyle that we can live under work if we don't take time to breathe, and everything can become mechanical if we let it. Five alarms, four meetings, three assignments, two same-day reports, one double espresso, zero time. Emails to answer, 49. Lunch at desk, a solid 29. Another angry customer, nine. Carry till two, sprint to five, and drive. 15 to yoga, 60 full lotus, free. Emails to answer, endless. 30 to drive downtown and clock in. Five to analyze and assess bump on skin. 15 coworkers, two assholes, just no patience. Five to call family and signal activity. Five breaths, repeat. Five breaths, repeat. Five breaths, repeat. Go drive home and settle in. 30 to think work-life balance and schedule. Fortune 500 recommends tips to better life. Article, how to have it all at work by 45. 401k, savings, retirement, there's just no time. One digital phone, 45 dinner to refuel and survive, 30 to recharge and process if I'm even alive. Ooh, 
always good having a dose of reality. <laughs> Mr. Martin Hinkle, who hasn't been here in a while. Come on up here. Give him a nice round of applause. Give me a bad, a bad round of applause. <laughs> That's a bad round of applause. Like this. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, these are not my words, and this is not the right order. 